Let's pray again. God, as we turn our attention now to 1 Timothy chapter 6, we want to hear from you. God, I thank you for the fact that we have your written word in our language. So easy to understand. We don't have to learn Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic to understand these words. Thank you, Lord, for the translation efforts that have gone into making this happen. I pray, Lord, for those who right now are still translating scriptures into the languages of people who don't have these words in their language yet. God, I pray your blessings on our time here right now. Again, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm going to start off with an introduction here. You can see on the, the wall behind me a picture of a help wanted sign. It's a sign we've seen frequently the past few years. It seems that employers can't find people willing to work or to do a good job. Now, having myself helped several people look for work, it's frustrating when employers talk like they can't find anybody, but when you recommend people to them, they seem to uh, shrug their shoulders and pass them over. On the surface, at least, there seems to be as much trouble with employers as with employees. But a deeper look, I think, reveals employers tired of being burned by subpar employees. When we come to the next paragraph in Paul's first letter to Timothy, we find two verses that are very applicable to this very relevant topic. When we see them in their context, they don't really seem to fit well with what's around it, which is why I identified it as part of the section before it, broadly described as addressing certain people in the church. So that's all of chapter 5 and these first two verses of chapter 6. So, while I'm beginning a second, uh, another chapter, uh, we're still in that same section we've been in now for several weeks. This will end that section. So Paul exhorts Timothy as the head pastor of the church at Ephesus to exercise careful oversight in the spiritual care of the church by correcting people in appropriate ways and ensuring that spiritually qualified people were in positions of spiritual leadership. And it's also important in the functioning of the church that people relate to one another in appropriate ways. The final aspect of directions regarding people in the church deals with one significant area of these relationships, particularly that of servants and masters. Now, before we read these two verses, we really need to understand the cultural context of those under Timothy's care. Because if you don't, if your Bible translates this as slaves and masters, that, that we're like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Now, the ESV uses servants, and about 50-50. It seems like translations with 50-50, either servants or slaves, and we'll get into that in a minute. So we need to understand what, what was going on in Timothy's day. Again, I use that word servants to describe this section. And again, it's translated by various translations, either, either Greek or, or either servant or slave. And that's because the Greek word that's used here can, can be used to describe either one. And there really wasn't a lot of difference between the two. These were people who were owned by a master who had control over them. Though the system in the Roman Empire had once been one of abuse and neglect, of these humans as though they were little more than livestock or property. By the first century, when this was written, owners had realized that contented slaves were more productive. And so it wasn't uncommon by this time to find close friendships, actually, between slaves and their masters. And masters would oftentimes teach their slaves their trades. So this is not the... the the, the horrible picture of slavery that we might envision. And also, by some estimates, as much as half of the population of the Roman Empire was slaves. 
half the people in the nation fit in this category. And that's, there's estimates, different estimates on that, from a third to a half. And by and large, these were not men, women, and children in chains and shackles, enduring constant beatings as they labored in the hot sun. Still, they had no legal recognition as persons. They were, at the end of the day, still considered property of their masters. That said, a person was often better off as a slave than as a free day laborer, which may explain why so many of the people were slaves. Because it usually afforded them better food, better clothing, better shelter than they could possibly earn on their own. This system was employed by the British Trading Corporation, the Virginia Company, in the 1607 Jamestown to settle the New World, as it was called. People could get passage to the New World, at least 25 acres of land, a year's worth of corn, guns, a cow and new clothes in exchange for serving the Virginia company for a contracted period of time of several years. They would sell themselves into slavery. They would, be, they would be owned by the Virginia company, but they would get all of these benefits after they fulfilled their commitment. They were called indentured servants. You think about by itself, passage across the Atlantic Ocean was out of reach for the common Englishman, and certainly for the poor Englishman. By most estimates, these indentured servants, as they were called, the ones who could survive the trip and the harsh conditions in the colony, ended up better off than those who came freely, who had, had to scrape the funds up themselves and get, get their way over here. These ones that came as indentured servants, oftentimes, and by and large, were better off. So put out of your mind the image of the degrading slavery that exists today in which women and children are abducted, bought, and sold as slaves the world over and treated by their owners as objects valuable only to the extent they can sell their bodies. And you can also put out of your mind the image of racial slavery as it exists today in the world where whole groups of men, women, and children are rounded up and forced to work in deplorable conditions more for punishment than for profit, simply because of their racial, ethnic, or perceived religious background. By the time Paul wrote this letter, the slaves that Timothy had in his church were probably more like indentured servants of colonial days. And they wouldn't be unlike factory workers of today. They lack the freedom. Many of you have worked in factories. Some of you may be working in factories now. And you... you you lack that freedom. You kind of have this view of if I owned my own business, if I was an entrepreneur, if I was self-employed, I would have the freedom to go where I wanted to go when I would be my own boss. Some of you have done that and you're going, that's not the way it works. But when you work in the factory, you kind of have this, this glorious vision of what it could be like if I was not a slave to my master, this corporation. They tell me when I have to be at work, they tell me how many days I have to work. They tell me if I can take vacation. They, they control my life. I'm a slave. Oh, to be self-employed. I hear the giggles because I know many of you have been self-employed or are self-employed. You know it's not as glorious as it sounds. Because it's, it is very much like that indentured servant who comes to the United States and they're slave for those years, but then they get all this stuff. And the one who scrapes their pennies together and saves their money and buys that passage to come across the Atlantic Ocean to, to the colonies, they get there and, man, the, world, the deck is stacked against them. They're self-employed. Yeah, they're free. But, man, it's hard. And so for those who work in the factory or those who work in the food service industry or retail sales or delivery or service industries, they have an employer who bears the risk of profit or loss and pays them for their time, regardless of profitability. All of these folks fit into this category of the servant-master relationship. And the reality is that at some point in the past, now, or in the future, I would say almost everyone in this room or watching online is in this category. 
There's very few that aren't in this category at some point in your life where you are owned, if you will, by someone else. They tell you what to do. They tell you when to come to work. They tell you when you can get off. They tell you what's up. They own you. So these two verses apply to all of us at some level. So let's read them with that perspective. So 1 Timothy chapter 6, the first two verses. But all who are under yoke as a bondservant. Now remember, that's going to be all of us at some point in our lives. Regard their own masters as worthy of all honor so that the name of God and the teaching may not be reviled. Those who have believing masters must not be disrespectful on the ground that they are brothers. Rather, they must serve all the better, since those who benefit by their, their good service are believers and beloved. Now think about the gospel, this revolutionary thing in the first century. It elevated women to whole new levels. And Paul addressed the issues arising from that and how they would fit into the body with those new countercultural norms. And in the same way, the gospel elevated slaves to whole new levels. And so if you're in a church, as the first century church would have been, with both slaves and slave owners participating in the body now as equals in Christ, it's easy to imagine the challenges that would arise. First, there will be slaves in the church whose masters who weren't in the church, did not understand the gospel or believe it. So what do you do when your boss or your master scoffs at you because of your newfound faith in this Jesus guy, whoever he was? What if your superior has a chip on his shoulders toward Christians and burdens you with extra weight because of it? These aren't theoretical questions to us. Neither were the theoretical questions to the Ephesian Christians who Timothy pastored. The Lord reminds us through Paul's words that we are to honor unbelieving masters. Now, I added the word unbelieving there. I put it in brackets because while it's not in the text, it is most assuredly implied. We're to show honor to those who have authority over us in the workplace, whether they're believers or not, but in particularly unbelievers at this point. This word honor is the same word we saw last week in the section before this when the church was instructed to let the elders who rule well be considered of double honor, especially those who are preaching and teaching. So the Greek word that's translated in both places as honor is the same thing here. So it's this idea of showing respect, but as we said last week in, in that that double honor for the elder, we talked about financial pay as well. And so if does that mean then that this honor to, that, the, that this employee is supposed to show to his boss or the slave to his master, does that mean he's supposed to give money to him? Well, I don't think so. <laughs> Obviously, I don't give money to my boss. If I'm working down at Walmart, I don't pay Walmart. They pay me. So what's this honor stuff? How am I supposed to show honor? Now, think for a minute. We'll use the example of working at Walmart, because no one likes Walmart, so we'll just pick on Walmart today, right? We like the cheap stuff they've got, but we, other than that, we kind of got this stigma against Walmart. So I'm working for Walmart. Now, Walmart doesn't just give me money. Not because I deserve it or I need it to survive. They could really care less about that. They give it to me because I have actually given them something in exchange for it. My boss has received a benefit from the effort I have put into his endeavor, which has helped him earn a profit. I have sold my effort to him, and he pays me for it, as agreed. So the financial aspect of the honor in this context is the financial benefit my employer receives because of what I do for him. Now I have the picture on the wall of bricklayers. Anyone in here laid brick before? Hmm. I, 
I got to help a guy do it a little bit once. He was a, he was a pro. It was really cool watching him work. I handed him bricks. He, he was laying them that fast that I was handing bricks to this guy. We were doing it as, on a volunteer project for a church. But nonetheless, if he had been doing it professionally, which he had done, and I was working for him, my handing him bricks, I was helping him make money. It was his job, and he would pay me for that. Probably buy the brick. That's usually how they do that. So I'm working for him. He's giving me something because I'm giving something to him. I'm showing him honor just by doing the work. This is an instruction from Scripture which believers today seem to be missing. Perhaps it's because they don't understand its implications. Now, you'll notice on your outline there's a big giant gap there. Some of you are going, what? what? There's a mistake here. <laughs> what's, what's this gap on my outline? It's because I'm going to insert some things here that are, uh, I want to give some examples of how we honor the one who would be the same as the master in Timothy's day. This is the teaching that the church seems to be missing as employers struggle to find people, including Christians, who will actually work. Now, I'm going to use the male personal pronouns here, but realize that it applies equally whether this person who is the boss or the master is a male or a female. Here are some practical ways we show honor to a person who employs us. And, and let me be clear on this. Whether we are paid or not. When I was handing bricks to Eddie Sykes was the guy. When I was handing bricks to Eddie... I wasn't getting paid, neither was he, but I was doing that job just the same as if I was. It didn't matter. So how do we honor that person for whom we're working? Well, here's an easy one. Be on time. For crying out loud. I have a, one of our parents who, of our teens on Friday nights. He has a construction business, Bill Steel Buildings, and his biggest beef is he can't, he picks guys up at their homes and they're not up and ready to go. You can't get much worse than that. Be on time. Respect the time by being where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there, if not before. And then do your best. Always complete the assigned task to the best of your ability. If you have difficulty, let them know and seek advice on how to improve. How about this one? Exceed expectations. Strive to exceed the minimum expectations and standards. Always go above and beyond the minimum. Show integrity. Be honest and above board in every transaction. You're a Christian for crying out loud. That should go without saying, but let me say it in any way. Show integrity. And I'll go ahead and say this one too. Work hard, though that's already been implied. Work hard and be efficient with your time the entire time you're on the job. Don't slough off, no matter how tired you may be. If you're too tired... You just better get some more sleep at home because that's where that's supposed to happen. <laughs> not, when you're, not when you're being paid to work. Go to bed earlier. How about this one? Recognize how critical you are. Embrace your role in making the business or endeavor profitable or successful. As I was handing bricks to Eddie, I was embracing the role of, we're going to get this wall finished today, and I have a critical part in this. He wants them handed to him a certain way, and I'm going to do it that way, and I'm going to ask him, is there something else I can do? I'm not going to be standing around here twiddling my thumbs. Give me something to do, because I want to make this endeavor successful. Again, regardless of whether you're being paid or not. Now, granted, these are not strictly Christian principles. There are many non-Christians who work this way. For the Christian, though, we are to see these as ways to show honor to the one for whom we are working. And by the way, 
Again, that includes even the one for whom we're working for free. It's called work ethic. And for the Christian, it must be about showing great honor to the one benefiting from our work. Like the display of honor to a spiritual elder in the church, a slave was to demonstrate that to the man who was his master or owner, even if that man was not a believer. Of course, it equally applies to believing and unbelieving masters, but how we relate to an unbelieving master or employer in a different way reflects on God's name. Peter also instructed regarding this. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, Peter said, Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution. And then he talked for quite a while right after that about how that relates to our subjection to the human institution of government and honoring its leaders. And then in verse 18, he talked about it relating to our subjection to masters. He said in verse 18, Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. <sighs> really? Even the unjust? It's... I can, it was easy working for Eddie, handing him bricks, because he was a just man. I poured concrete for another guy named Eddie in Kansas. He was a just man. I liked working for him. It was hard work, it's backbreaking work, but I liked working for him. He was a just man. That's easy. But what if my boss is an unjust man? Also for the unjust, for this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Why? Why would we do that? Because it's for the Lord's sake. It is a witness for the name and sake of Jesus. Not only that, the Lord says through Peter in verse 20, For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? Big deal. You kind of should expect that. But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Now it's important to read that in the context of servants relating to masters who are unjust. Those guys had no choice. They had no escape clause. If they did escape, they did run away, they were in deep trouble. There's actually a book of the Bible written to a slave owner, Philemon. Paul wrote that. Because Onesimus, Philemon's slave, had run away from Philemon. He ended up in Paul's company. Paul writes this letter back to um, Philemon. He says, look, Onesimus did wrong. He's since come to Christ. I'm sending him back. That was the only escape clause. You had to run, and you were a marked man, and you would be in trouble. You could lose your life. So there was no escape clause. When beatings came for their misbehavior, it was to be expected. But when they suffered for doing good, they were to take encouragement that their suffering was gracious in God's sight. They were to remember that Jesus suffered for them, leaving an example of patiently enduring unjust suffering on our behalf. So enduring this kind of suffering is vital to validating the gospel. We find this reiterated in Titus chapter 2. Titus 2, verse 9, Paul writes this, Bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. Now this clearly speaks to every Christian employee. We are to behave like this so that in everything we may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. As Paul told Timothy in our text in 1 Timothy, it reflects on Christian teaching. 
Our behavior at work is a way we adorn the teaching of Christianity. This adorn is translated from a Greek word meaning to put in order, to arrange, to ornament, to embellish with honor. I like that. We're embellishing the teachings of Christ with honor by how we react in our employment situations. Our Christ-like behavior toward employers then is like a beautiful decoration that draws attention to the life-changing validity of the teachings of God to which we subscribe. Now the other possibility is that when the person over you is a Christian. Thus, Paul addresses the situation of relating the Christian masters. He says not to disrespect them just because they're your equal in Christ, in other words, your brother. Now, earlier, Paul told Timothy not to let anyone despise him because he was young. Now, the Greek word from which that word despise is translated is the same in both places meaning to condemn or despise or to think little or nothing of. In the same way, the Christian who is employed by a fellow Christian is not to treat him with disdain or think of him in his position of authority over him, think little of him in that position. It can be difficult for an employee to differentiate between the relationship he has with a Christian brother in the church and the relationship he has in the workplace he may feel more freedom to question the decisions, directions, or authority of one who on Sunday is his equal in Christ and on Monday is his superior. This very real tendency has led to the, to the tendency or scenario, it's led to the tendency of these folks not to want to associate with one another in church. But if Christians would heed this warning not to show disrespect in any way to the Christian who in the secular world has authority over them, it would lessen this tension. Instead, when we are working for the fellow believer, we are to serve them well, realizing that they are providing a service and an income for myself and for other believers, and also as they give to the church. In recent years, it's become more front-page headline news as businesses are struggling to survive, not so much because there's not demand for their products or services, as much as they just can't find people to work. And when people do agree to work, they often don't show up, leaving the employer in a lurch and unable to complete the work necessary to keep the business going. If they show up in body, they don't show up in mind oftentimes, and they treat the job as just a way to get more money just because they are there. They fail to grasp the concept of how their own productivity makes that money come in. If I don't make the widgets the company for which I work sells, that company can't sell them and has no source of money to pay me. Where does that money come from if not from the widgets I'm making? I can't just sit there and sit there. I have to produce something. That's how that company is making money. That's how they're paying me. And if I do a substandard job of making them, my company's reputation suffers and their profits fall and it makes paying me difficult or impossible. And if many employees do the same thing, the company fails and they have to put signs up like Burger King put up. Sorry, we can't find anyone to work. Sadly, many know and will never likely see again many fall into this category. Many don't understand this concept that my work contributes to what, what my company does and that's how they pay me. And so I need to do a good job. We need to not cut corners just because we feel like, well, they owe it to me because I'm here. I showed up more than half the other people did. I showed up on time, too. We need to also apply the same principle to when we're working for free, when we do volunteer work. And now 
we get into a category, because many of you are retired, you go, I, I already, I have done my time. I'm done. But you're still doing things, you're still active. Hopefully, you're active in the Lord's service. That doesn't mean that we cut corners there. Those people we work for for free get the same level of quality a person who pays us would get, or they should. I'm always harping on, I wouldn't say harping on, my, my family hears this frequently from me. They have for several years, basically all, all my kids' lives, they've heard this. And it doesn't matter whether you're getting paid to do a job or not. You do that same level of quality. When we went to Louisiana to do work for somebody we'd never met before on a house and then went back, it didn't matter that we weren't getting paid, that we would never see this person again. We did the same quality of work for that person as we would if we were getting paid for it. It didn't matter. Because that reflects on the name of my Lord. Because I was, we were doing that in the name of Christ. I'm not going to cut corners on that. She got the same level of quality as anybody else. And when she called us and said, hey, we've got a problem, and we couldn't get any wealth put on her, we went back and we took care of those problems. It doesn't matter if anyone notices that the weeds and the gravel beds at church have been removed. We're going to keep them looking nice. It doesn't matter if nobody cares that the yard looks sharp all the time. It's important to do it right and keep the grounds looking like somebody cares. It doesn't matter if anyone notices. That's not the point. The inside of this building is attended every week by unnoticed volunteers who saw that nobody was in charge of vacuuming the carpet and cleaning the restrooms and emptying trash cans. Does anybody care that those things are magically done every week? The people who do those jobs every week around the building and grounds that we use every week have carried that same work ethic we're to have in the workplace into things for which they don't get paid and people don't notice. It's a way to show honor to their master, Jesus, serving in the menial tasks that nobody wants to do. Does anybody want to go out and pull weeds out of these gravel beds now the cracks in the, in the driveway? Do I hear some volunteers? Not usually. That's tedious work that no one notices that there's nothing growing in the cracks in the, in the sidewalks. No one notices when light bulbs are changed, when carpet is clean. No one notices that. We take it for granted, and that's okay, by the way. I'm not, that's okay. Because those people that do that do it because they're serving Jesus. They're showing honor to their master, Jesus, by doing those things. And that's the same principle we have when we work at Walmart, at Pico, laying bricks, taking trash, whatever job we have, we have that same perspective. We're honoring our master, our human master, yes, because it's a witness tool, but also our master, Jesus. It applies to the long hours spent managing the church finances, organizing missions projects, practicing and preparing for worship, planning lessons to be taught in Sunday school and Bible studies, thinking through activities and schedules, and a dozen other responsibilities. Many of you are retired. You're no longer working for the man so what master do you serve now? Yourself? Really, think about it. We live, I was talking to someone about this this week, I don't remember who it was, I think it was Keith, it doesn't matter. We're, we live in such a wealthy nation that we can expect to work for 20 or 30 years and then retire and do nothing for 20 or 30 years. What a rich nation in which we live. I've done my 30 years, now I'm collecting my check, and I'm going to go fishing and go all across the country, and all the things that I want to do. Man, now, I know not everyone gets to do that. But nonetheless, 
So when you retire and you're no longer serving the man, who are you serving? Who is your master now? Me? Am I? I'm on the master of my own destiny now. I don't have anyone telling me where to go and what to do and how, how, off, how to do it and all that kind of stuff. I am my own boss now. I'm free. I'm retired. I hope you don't see yourself as your own master. Now, for those still in the workforce, what master do you serve? When it comes to Christian work ethic playing out in the workplace, these two verses may seem too simplified an application to what usually ends up as a very complex situation. What about would you work for Walmart, that giant, heartless corporation? I mean, yeah, you've got a boss, and he's got a boss, and they've got a boss on so on and so forth up the line, but no one really knows the man. That's why they call him the man. It's just Walmart, this giant corporation that will eat you alive and spit you out and not even bat an eye. They do it all the time. What do you do when it's that? What about if my employer cheats me? What if I'm just volunteering in the church or elsewhere? We can always find numerous things that make it seem like our situation is different or unique from the description. And we're often quick to dismiss the possibility of Scripture applying to our unique situation. See, that's different for me. You know, I'm, I'm the youth pastor or the choir director of this church, and I do that work. I spend long hours, and I don't get paid for that. I don't get paid for this. And so, I don't deserve this respect I'm getting. <laughs> Maybe you've been there. Maybe you get paid and you say, I don't deserve that respect, disrespect. But at any rate, we kind of get this idea, well, my, my situation is unique. Uh, you know, I serve as the choir director. I can pick on that one because we don't have that here, so I'll pick on that, that straw man. I serve as the choir director. I assemble all of these, these musical scores, and I teach these people, and I train them, and I, and I put these programs together, and I don't get paid for any of that. So it really doesn't, if I... If I, if I don't do it just right, well, you know, I'm not getting paid anyway. And so this doesn't really apply to me. You see how we do that? We look at our circumstances and we say, well, it doesn't fit precisely something described in the Scripture, and we let ourselves off the hook in following the instruction. And we do that in way more areas than just this, by the way. We must be very, very careful. You say, well, I'm retired, so it doesn't apply to me. Well, we've looked at some ways that it does. So in humility, we must approach the Scripture with a mind open to the possibility that God is showing us something. And then simply ask Him, Lord, how do I need to apply this to my life? Does it apply even though it seems like my situation is different than this? It doesn't line up with all this. So I got some things that are, are kind of make, make this so it doesn't apply to me. I have a boss who's unreasonable, takes advantage of me, cheats me. You just don't understand, God. I, I just can't. I can't. Or I am just serving in this position for free. I'm doing all this work for free, and so it doesn't really apply to me. But say, Lord, how do I respond? What do I do in this situation? Our challenge is to seek the Lord in how to apply what may seem like oversimplified principles. Because these provide a framework within which we are to operate. They're guidelines that we must seek the Lord on how to apply in our own situation. Whether I'm retired, whether I'm volunteering, whether I'm self-employed, whether I'm working for the man. Lord, how does this apply? When we will approach Scripture, all of it with that level of humility and say, Lord, I want to please you. I want to do what you say. 
I want to honor you. As you say, to honor the master, you are my master. I want to honor you. You've told me to honor the man or woman who's over me. How do I do that in this situation? Because this is really hard. I'm not, I, I don't want to. I'm being beaten. Have any of you ever been beaten, physically beaten at work? Probably not. The guys that Paul was writing to could have been beaten, literally, physically beaten. And Paul said, or Peter said, hey, if you're beaten unjustly, take it with grace from God. So you can be a witness to the one who's doing that to you. And that's not talking about being hauled off to jail unjustly and persecuted in that respect. That's just talking about their slave masters beating them unjustly. I know many of you have, have or maybe even are facing difficult circumstances at work where you feel like, man, these people just don't appreciate me. They're taking advantage of me. I'm not being paid what I'm worth. So I'm not going to I'm not going to break my back to do the work that I'm supposed to do. I think that's probably one of the things that the scripture is talking to here. But we so quickly say, well, uh, no, my situation is different. That we don't even listen. We don't even accept the possibility that God could be saying, hey, look, look, th this is actually applies to you. This list of things are ways to show honor to the one for whom you're working, even if it is the man. We're going to close in prayer this morning, as we always do. I'm going to ask you to pray in response to what God is speaking to you. Again, pray out loud, pray silently, but pray in response to what God is doing. God, as you have given us these words from both Paul and Peter, these words that are difficult oftentimes for us to take, even when we actually get paid for the work we're doing. Think about the, the slaves to whom Paul wrote and to whom Peter wrote, who did not have even the ability to, to get out of uh, their employment. They were stuck. If they ran, it meant death, punishable by the government. And Lord, we don't understand that. But Lord, we understand feeling trapped. We understand the sense in which we feel like, oh, I just, I, I, I need to get out of this, but I don't know how. And we're tempted to slough off, to disrespect, to dishonor those above us. God, help us. Help us to, to reflect Jesus to those above us. Whether we're paid for a job or not, that we would work as we're serving the Master Jesus.
Lord, I think about those who serve on the activities committee at church and the challenge that they have to um, consider things that opportunities to build fellowship in the church and uh, oftentimes Lord that they can there can be uh, a discouragement when they hear uh, snide remarks about different activities that have been planned those are types of things that make you want to say I don't get paid enough for this God, I pray for those leaders in the church who work tirelessly behind the scenes, oftentimes spending many hours, unknown, unseen. I pray that you would encourage them, bless them. I thank you, Lord, for these folks that you have called to be part of this church who do work so diligently, who don't need to be told, hey, look, Take this job seriously because you're working for the master, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you would remind us, make us ever mindful of that fact, no matter what we're doing, whether we're working for the man or working in our own minds, perhaps for the church, though ultimately we're working for you. God, that we would serve with full attention to detail and doing a good job so that we glorify and honor you as well as any human authority over us. God, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for this word this morning. I pray, Lord, for those who may be struggling right now, wondering, thinking to themselves, oh, man, I don't, I don't want, I don't like my boss. I don't like my job. Give them grace, Lord, as they endure those trials, as they, as they work faithfully, showing honor, that they will be a witness, and that you would bless them for that, Lord. God, I thank you for your presence here this morning and for speaking to us through your word. We pray your blessings on each one who's here. Again, those who are watching online, as we go about our different tasks this week, that we would do them with an eye towards pleasing you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.